Today, we will talk a bit of, about how we monitor for ocean acidification. Um, but this is going to be a more of a specific talk about one piece of equipment that uh, we have developed and deployed uh, in Dominica and Belize uh, over the last few years. So it's going to be it's going to get very uh, technical and very specific. Um, so if you don't have an interest in um, or a technical interest in in this sort of um, work, uh, don't feel bad about leaving the the meeting. Um, So, th so this is the outline of the talk. Uh, we're going to spend the first part of the talk just introducing the ocean acidification kit. Uh, we're going to try and show you some uh, videos uh, of how to set up the equipment. Let's hope uh, those work. And then for the second part, we're going to focus on troubleshooting. So we're going to identify some common uh, issues we or you may have with sensors or you may face when you use the sensors. Uh, we're going to talk about biofouling, which is a, can be a big problem. Um, and some issues we had with uh, telemetry. So starting up, the objective of uh, this particular part of the Commonwealth Marine Economies program uh, was to provide small island developing states with the capacity to, more, to measure autonomously ocean acidification and ocean warming so that they can make informed decisions on how to manage the marine environment, to address their commitment to minimize and address impacts of ocean acidification, which is part of the Sustainable Development Goal 14.3, which we talked about yesterday a lot, but also contribute to the global efforts of understanding uh, and monitoring uh, the ocean and ocean acidification. So to do this, we have uh, developed a new bespoke piece of kit, which we call the ocean acidification uh, sensor kit. We wanted to develop something that could be deployed by um, untrained uh, personnel using small boats without having any uh, laboratory infrastructure. Something that can be easily deployed, is low maintenance, uh, and can give you uh, the required uh, measurement performance uh, to answer the questions or monitor ocean acidification. So this is a, a drawing here you see on your right uh, of the second version of the ocean acidification sensor kit. Uh, it's basically a stainless steel frame. It's fairly small, like a, a small luggage. Uh, it has a pH sensor here on the right. It has a, a sensor that measures temperature, salinity, and dissolved oxygen. And it has a battery pack. Uh, so both the pH sensor and the uh, CTD sensor or the temperature and salinity dissolved oxygen sensor are really high quality state-of-the-art sensors. They can make these measurements with very high accuracy and precision. Now this kit also has telemetry capability. So when the measurements take place, those measurements can be relayed through a satellite unit and through satellite. Uh, to anywhere you want, uh, either on your computer through email or uh, on a server, depending what you choose, and can be um, displayed also uh, online, which is what we do. Uh, we chose to use uh, these uh, rechargeable batteries because we want to minimize waste and we also want to minimize uh, the expense required to run this kit. It's depth rated 150 meters, although we don't want to be deploying deeper than 10 meters. Um, 
and it can be, it's very versatile. It can be deployed uh, on the sea bottom. It can be um, suspended over a float. It can be attached on a pylon or a, uh, on a pier or so on. So this is what it looks like. So at the moment we have two versions in use. So on the left, um, we have version one and on the right, we have version two. Uh, they're very similar. They have exactly the same sensors on them. Version one is a bit more robust, a bit more heavy. It has a different battery pack. Uh, in that case, we had an off-the-shelf battery pack, um, which included all the electronics uh, for the kit. But then on this upgrade version, uh, at the right, we went with a lighter, a more lightweight frame, a different shape, so it's, uh, it balances better if it's deployed on the, at the sea bottom. And it also has a bespoke uh, house-made battery pack, uh, which uh, met our deployment needs better. It was also cheaper. The other difference is that the second version has a, a separate electronics hub that is um, within the frame. So at the heart of this uh, ocean nestification kit is the pH sensor, of course. Uh, on the left, you see the pH sensor with uh, its hat on. So that hat is just a piece of plastic tube that we use to hang the reagent back, but also the waste back because we don't, we don't want to be releasing anything into the environment. So this sensor uses reagents to make the measurements uh, that are held in a little reagent back. But when the measurement takes place, all the waste uh, it's kept in a bag, so it's not released in the environment. And here, at the right, you actually see the, the sensor, which is the bottom part, which holds all the electronics, all the hardware that makes it make the measurement. So if you take this apart and look inside it, um, you see something uh, like the device uh, on your left. Uh, what you see is, this is the black thing here, is the end cap, which is also the microfluidic chip. So the way the sensor works is that it takes a seawater sample, it takes it in, it mixes it with a reagent, uh, the reagent changes color, then there's an optical measurement, and based on that, the, the determination of pH takes place. So all that liquid manipulation and chemical reactions and mixing and all that takes place in this microfluidic chip. And this is just a piece of plastic with these micro channels um, carved into it. So it's a series of channels and tubes. And on the top, we have things like valves. We have this pump here uh, bolted in that pushes in and out fluid as needed. And of course we have electronic boards for controlling all the components, but also doing calculations, doing a data processing, communicating with uh, other uh, platforms and other sensors on the outside as well. So it's a pretty intelligent uh, sensor as well. So how does the analytical assay work? So if you want to measure pH in seawater, the standard method uh, that people advise you to use, it's a spectrophotometric method using um, a pH indicator dye. Uh, and in this case for surface seawater is called metacresyl purple. So this is just a, a dye that looks red when you take it off, off the shelf. But then when you add it in seawater, the color of the dye and the seawater that the dye is in, it will change depending on the pH of that seawater. So if the pH tends to be acidic, it will turn yellow. If the pH is basic, it will turn purple and even blue in extreme cases. Seawater pH is somewhere in between. So if you add that dye into normal seawater, there's gonna be a combination of yellow and purple colors. So if you have a system 
where you can measure exactly how much yellow and how much purple color you have in that solution, then you can tell with a very, very good accuracy and precision on what the pH of that solution is. And that's what we do. So what the sensor does, as I said earlier, it takes a sample of seawater from the environment, and then it adds a little bit of dye. And that dye starts to diffuse in the seawater in those micro channels, and then the pump slowly pushes the dye and in, in the seawater through what we call an optical cell. So in that optical cell, we spectrophotometrically measure how much yellow and how much purple um, colors we have. And if we actually take the ratio of those two, we can calculate what the pH is. And this is the raw data that comes out from the sensor in this, uh, in this slide. On the top, each one of these uh, peaks uh, represents one measurement, and it's a magnification here at the bottom. You see here the two lines. Each line is one represents one light wavelength. One is four three four, and one the other one is five seven eight nanometers, and that represents a different color. So, if we measure the absorption of both wavelengths, which represent two colors of the dye, then we can um, calculate the pH. So um, we are now at the second version of a pH sensor. So for those of you who already have one, you remember that the sensor has these small um, connectors, electronics and data connectors called IE55s. So those are small and they're nice because they don't take much space. But if you work with them for a while, you see how annoying they can be because it's hard to get the little plug uh, in um, easily, especially if you have other things around. Uh, it's the risk that you bend one of the little pins inside is, is very high. And also if you get any seawater on those pins, which are made out of brass or copper, they degrade very fast. So we decided to move away from those and move to uh, this other connector here on the second version called a subcon. So that our sensors now going forward, they all have subcon sensors, uh, some subcon con connectors, sorry, which are much more robust, much more waterproof, and much easier to work with. I'm going to show you uh, today uh, how you um, work with this, how you plug, uh, plug them in and so on. The other thing you, you notice is that instead of two connectors, now we only have one. So we do everything we need with just one connector. So the way the sensor works is that uh, we program it to run on a certain frequency. Uh, the sensor will run, makes a, a number of uh, uh, measurements. Then it, it puts everything in a, in a file. That, that file can be quite large, depending how, how long the sensor has been measuring. If it's been measuring for a couple of months, well, as you can see on here, it can be, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of megabytes. So what we do, we download the, that um, raw data file and then we process it on our computer using the software that is provided with the, with the sensor. And when we do that, uh, we have our final data that basically tells us what the pH was at a certain time. It tells us, um, what the temperature was, what the salinity was, what the dissolved oxygen was, and so on. 
Now, the other sensor on the ocean acidification kit is uh, what we call the CTD. So CTD stands for um, uh, conductivity, temperature, and depth. This particular sensor doesn't have a depth uh, uh, gauge. So it only measures conductivity, temperature, but it also measures dissolved oxygen. So from the conductivity, we'll calculate salinity. And therefore, we have from just this one sensor, we have salinity, temperature, and dissolved oxygen measurements. So it's a really powerful sensor. It's used all over the ocean for really high quality oceanographic measurements. And it's an autonomous sensors. It can, it can be used on its own. So in, in our case, we use it as part of a, the ocean certification kit, but it can be used on its own. It's got its own software and so on. Um, and it can, uh, it's uh, self-powered. It has uh, batteries inside the housing and can measure for quite a long times as well. You can deploy it for a whole year without having to uh, change batteries. One of the advantages is that it can communicate with other instruments or other platforms. And other platforms or other sensors can demand uh, measurements from it. And that's how we use it in our case. So in our case, our pH sensor will uh, communicate with this uh, CTD sensor and ask for temperature and salinity and dissolved oxygen measurements. So every time the pH sensor makes a measurement, we'll send a message to the CTD and say, can you make a measurement of temperature, salinity, and dissolved oxygen? And then you will take those on board. It has a pumped flow. So it has its own little pump. So what happens every time it wants to make a measurement, you see here on the picture, the intake, it will suck water in, we'll take it up through the sensors and then we push it back down and out through the exhaust. Now, what this allows is that for, it allows the measurement to take place on really fresh water because it just got pumped in, but it also runs the water through this anti fouland device, which is basically a little poison cartridge that kills everything within this tube. So you cannot have any fouling on the internal, um, sensors, which could compromise the measurements. That is one of the reasons that if you're handling this particular sensor, especially close to uh, these little holes, the intake and the outlet, you should always wash your hands afterwards. So the electronics hub, which I mentioned earlier, on version one, the electronics hub was part of the battery pack. So as you see here on the left this is the battery pack and this is the electronics hub, which is basically one electronics board uh, attached to the lid. So this was version one. In version two, because we made our own battery pack, we uh, put it, we put the uh, electronics hub on the outside in its own little uh, space. So it's difficult to see from here, but it's between the two uh, sensors. So what's the, the job of the hub? So the hub, we will, it will take measurements from the pH sensor, but would also take measurements from the CTD sensor. And then it will combine this data, it will allow for the pH sensor to do the right calculations for the pH, and then we'll take all the corrected data and send it through the to the telemetry unit if the telemetry unit is connected. So it basically it takes data from uh, all the sensors as required and then sends them away. So batteries. Developing batteries for this project was one of the biggest challenges we've had. Um, 
Uh, I'm sure you, a lot of you appreciate how uh, batteries uh, are a challenge with a lot of devices we use uh, in our lives these days. Um, telephones, electric cars, and it's always uh, challenging to maintain um, you know, good life of the batteries, make sure the batteries last long, but also um, they can hold char a charge for a long time. So in our case, we wanted to avoid using disposable batteries. First of all, because that's bad for the environment. Second of all, because they're expensive and we didn't want to impose another expense for this um, activity. So our only option was to use this uh, nickel metal hydride rechargeable batteries. So these are basically diesel batteries. So the size you put, um, the size of the batteries you put in your torches or flashlights. And there's lots of these stacked in these housings in series and in parallel to get the right voltage. Uh, and this worked really well. Unfortunately, to get the, the right uh, power out of them, you need to use quite a lot. So it's relatively heavy battery pack. Um, I think the biggest disadvantage that we, we found so far is that they do not like to sit um, empty for a long time. So if you use the batteries, if you run them down empty, uh, and then you let them sit empty, then the battery battery cells start to degrade. And then when, it, when it's time to recharge them again, you will not succeed in achieving uh, the amount of charge that you achieved the first time around. So the last thing you wanna do with these cells is to run them empty and let them sit empty. If you want to store them for some time, just make sure you store them charged. There is a way if you did uh, have to leave them empty for some time, there is, there is a way to bring them back at least partially, partially to life by um, exercising them. So charging them, running them down, and then charging them, running them down. But I don't think it's, you have, for those of you who have these battery packs, I don't think it's easy to um, uh, run them down unless you deploy the sensor pack. And how do we charge this? We basically have uh, these battery chargers. I think there's three of them connected together, each one for each stack of batteries within the housing. Uh, you switch the chargers on. These are quite clever chargers. Uh, the LED switches orange for a few seconds. Uh, and then during initialization, uh, the light will switch from orange to yellow. This will last for several seconds. Then it would switch to fast charge, which is the main charging period. Uh, well, the light will, will change from yellow to orange again. This will take several hours. And then when it reaches the point uh, where the batteries are close to being uh, full, uh, the charge will change from orange to green. Uh, and then every uh, now and then the yellow uh, light will flash. And then at the end, when it's all finished, um, it will, um, the light will turn green. So it's pretty straight, straightforward. Oops. So I think that's all I had for introduction of the equipment. I think we're right on time as well. Um, are there any questions with regards to this introduction? Anyone? 
Um, hi, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Um, yes, my secretary Ford from University of the West Indies. We have a, a sensor, pH sensor kit that we have deployed <coughs> um, in shallow water, um, the ISAMI. Yes. From, are you familiar with it? Yes, I am, yes. Okay, I was just wondering if you could, because obviously there are quite a few differences between this one and the I, mm -hmm. Sammy, and I was just wondering if you could run on the, if you were not going to do it or later in your lecture, if you could just say something about the pros and cons of, of yeah. the two types. So um, the ISAMI is a sensor made by a company called Sunburst in, in the US. So I assume you have an ISAMI because um, you were part of the Ocean Foundation um, ocean Correct. education work. Yes. All right. Um, so the, the ISAMI is based on the full size sensor, which is called uh, SAMI PH, if you're familiar with that, which is the, their main sensor that they sell, which is for open ocean deployments and long term de deployments and, and so on. And that sensor is more comparable to the one that I just showed today. So our sensor is, is developed for uh, oceanographic applications in general. It can go down to 6,000 meters. It can measure pH for uh, long periods of time. The ICE Army was developed for small, short um, little experiments. It has a, a maximum depth rating of two meters, if I, if I remember correctly. So, the ICE Army is useful if you want to do a, a short deployment to perhaps de determine the natural variability of your pH within a few days. But it's not the kind of sensor that you want to keep deploying uh, for long periods of time. It doesn't have the robustness uh, for that long term deployment. That is my understanding. It's made, it, it's made to be inexpensive, um, easy to use, but also for quick and short deployments rather than long uh, deployments in, in sometimes challenging environments. Does that answer your question? Um, sure, I have quite a few questions actually, but mm -hmm. I don't know if you're going um so i you said that the data is uploaded via satellite um yes. it, we have had sensors um in the past that require the data to be uploaded via satellite however there have been problems in that regard and then you know we kind of lose the data so is there is there no onboard storage of the data that in the event that that method doesn't work that you can actually when you remove it from the water download the data yes actually that's what that's what we're doing everything is stored on board and that's the data we actually use and work for um, the telemetry it's just a it's just a luxury it's, it's the cherry on the on the cake because it, it just offers us a real-time capability you can know, you know, you can sit in your, be sitting in your office and know what the temperature is out at your deployment site at any time. Um, and that can have some advantages, but the, the data that is being sent through the telemetry, it's not for, um, you know, for saving and, and, and working with. You want to download the data directly from the sensor uh, where you get much more information uh, you get the metadata and so on. So yeah, we don't we don't depend at all to the telemetry. It's just a, a nice add-on luxury, let's say. Um, all right. So my next question is the duration of the deployment time and the battery life. Um, you said that um, with the ISAMI, that's for short-term deployment. Uh, 
how long can this be deployed or the recommended deployment in this interval and the battery life? So we designed, we designed our batteries and our system to um, be able to do um, one month deployment for one measurement per hour or two months for two for um, one measurement every two hours and so on. Uh, sometimes we get that much, sometimes we get less. Again, depends on the health of the batteries. The batteries are really sensitive, unfortunately, to uh, how long they sit empty. Um, yeah. But this, this, is, this was our goal. Our goal was uh, to provide something that uh, it's for coastal deployments. It's for sites that someone can go out there once a month, uh, once every two months without any, any issue. So you indicated that it's for deeper water, um, but typically what depth would you <clears throat> employ this? Clearly we're not going to be doing like 600 meters if we're doing coastal waters, but um, what is the sort of general depth that these are um, deployed at? So if we want to follow guidance from the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network, and if we want to submit data for SDG 14.3, we need to be recording data at a depth around 10 meters or, or less. That's what the guidance say. Okay. Uh, okay. And um, I think one more question, the maintenance and the cost of the instrument. The cost um, I cannot really provide because this equipment was made specifically uh, for the Commonwealth Marine Economies Program. So it's not, as a system, it's not for sale. So it was donated to, um, to the different countries. Um, however, components of the system are commercially available. Uh, I mean, the, the CTD sensor, for example, it's about $10,000 or around that. Uh, the pH sensor now is commercially available and that's probably around the same price, or a bit more expensive. Uh, so they're not uh, inexpensive to, you know, to, to go and buy. Um, but again, we haven't thought about commercializing the whole thing as a, as a single component. Sorry, and the Sorry. Can you repeat that. Maintenance, um, is it um, just cleaning it, or are there components that you would need to buy to be replaced period periodically? Uh, so for, for maintenance, uh, every sensor that you buy it requires that uh, is sent back to the manufacturer every year for servicing. So each each one of these sensors will need servicing. Um, every year. But again, I, I wouldn't know how much it would cost to do that uh, as a whole, for the system as a whole. Okay, thank you.